disciples following our Lord will now call upon our brother Mark Wilson to exhort us. Well, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what young people are here, I think there are, most of them are offered a camp. But friends, all, thank you, David, and thank you, John, for your inter introductions and reading. I'd like you all to open this morning, please, to that late reading, first of Peter chapter 1. We're going to stay very firmly planted there this morning. Peter an apostle and disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. He took up his discipleship with great vigour, commitment, strength of character and love for Jesus and also an incredible amount of loyalty. He sometimes labelled Peter, impetuous Peter, but I wonder whether that is actually a correct interpretation and perhaps by some of his actions, if we're thinking along those lines, we may be looking at our responses to his actions rather than his. Peter, the fisherman, used to rowing boats, sometimes in stormy weather, used to fishing, fishing with nets and hauling them in, keeping balance at the same time. Peter was a hardened man used to working in the outdoor elements and all that they could exert upon him. Peter, a strong man, a man of strength, of character and I suggest physique as well and that I think will show in some comments later on. Peter was strong with his belief that the man he was with was the Christ, the son of the living God. When he said that, there was no doubts in his voice, no element of fluctuating faith or conviction. And it was said at a time when people were disappearing from Jesus, not wanting to listen to him anymore because some of the things he was saying were a bit hard to understand and it was a bit strange. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, said Peter, thus confirming his conviction before his Lord and perhaps shoring up the conviction of those who were with him at the time. And yet there was that time in the boat, a place that he would be very much used to, where there was a storm and they were all in fear of their lives and they saw Jesus coming, walking on the water. Peter, after a brief conversation with his Lord, got out of the boat and walked toward Jesus until such time as the natural elements got the better of him. And he doubted, and his Lord reached out and saved him. We sometimes think that, yes, Peter, he shouldn't have lost faith on that account. No, Peter, you failed then. But how often do we in ourselves look and say, well, Peter, you actually did get out of the boat. And yes, Peter, you actually did walk on that water. And it was no mill pond. It was a storm. Would we have done the same? Perhaps we should keep Peter and hold Peter in a slightly different light in terms of his strength of character and his strength of faith. For his spirit was willing, though his flesh was weak, as we all suffer. Later on, Jesus said to them all, look, it's time, I've got to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be tried by wicked men, I'm going to be put to death, and I'm going to be raised on the third day. Well, they didn't hear the last comment very well. But their response, including Peter's, was, not without us, you're not. We're going to. We're going to die with you if need be. Don't worry about it, Jesus. We're with you all the way. 
subtext will help you set up the kingdom right now. Peter eventually was found napping, literally caught napping. Even though he was prepared for a fight, perhaps in a half asleep daze, reached for that sword, who knows where he had got it from. I suggest he was well prepared for such an eventuality to have it in the first place. But he pulled out that sword and took a very strong swipe at Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Malchus, perhaps being far more awake than Peter was at the time, ducked. And that sword clipped off Malchus's ear. But let's have no doubt about it. Peter was aiming at Malchus's head. And that was a weapon of war he had in his hands. And he meant to use it thoroughly. Malchus was very lucky to keep his head on his shoulders. <coughs> Jesus, though, rebuffed at him. Put it away, Peter. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And as if to reinforce that message, he reached down and picked up Malchus's ear. There was no doubt reeling at the time. And restored it to his person. As though it had never been displaced. I wonder if Malchus ever heard the words, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. But no doubt that scene resonated with those who did have that opportunity. With a Malchus, who knows, may one day have reconsidered his actions that night. And indeed, reconsidered the words of Jesus and heard them with thanks. Maybe we'll find out one day. Jesus being apprehended barters with the crowd and the mob there. You have me, don't take them in. You're not after them, you're after me. And so those that have been overpowered are released to join those who had fled earlier, perhaps, into the night. Peter rallies himself, though, again with a couple of others, and they find their way into the court where Jesus is taken. In the course of proceedings, Peter does deny his Lord three times. No, I don't know that man. No, I've had nothing to do with that man. No, I've never had anything to do with that man. I have absolutely no knowledge of him. And the rooster crowed. And Jesus looked at Peter. By any man's estimation, Jesus would have been totally forgiven for not being aware of Peter at all. With all that was going on around Jesus, the situation he was in, the accusations he was facing, the critical moment in his service that he was about to undertake in providing that great sacrifice for which we remember this morning and have come together to remember. Jesus, at that critical time, is aware of everything that is happening to Peter just a short distance away. But he turns and looks straight at him. What was in that look? Was it the look of, well, I told you, Peter. <laughs> you didn't listen to me, did you? Or was it, Peter, I know you love me. Have no fear. I love you too. And I'm going to go and do something now which is going to fix up all your faults. I know you love me. And I know your spirit is willing, oh, so willing. But your flesh is weak. Don't worry, Peter. I have to do this alone. I must be about my father's business. Peter, in panic, under the threat of those around him, flees the scene into the darkness, a crushed man, weeping bitterly. Am I too strong in suggesting that he was a crushed man? I suggest you consider it. He had exhibited all the attributes of a man who had fought for his Lord, fought valiantly, been prepared for the fight to defend his Lord against the foe. Not a problem. I'll be there, says Peter. I'll do it. Leave it to me. I'll help it. Not a problem. I'll fix it. And failed. <coughs> the other thing that people do when they're under threat is they run away, try and hide somewhere. 
And that's what he was doing now. The sword being removed from him, any personal, physical thing that he could do, any action that he could do had been removed from him and he was powerless. He was on his own, in the dark, weeping bitterly. And yet the wonder of it all is that a few days later he was found on the shore of Galilee in a conversation with that same Jesus, though now really not quite the same, for he'd been risen from the dead. It was not right that his God's holy one should see corruption. He was risen from the dead. And Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. And again, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Well then, Peter, feed my sheep. And again, Peter, do you love me? Oh Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my flock, Peter. And the penny drops. Peter has been forgiven for his denials. All that he had reconsidered or considered in the past would be his purpose and function in God's service in through Jesus to re-establish the kingdom, oust the Romans, get rid of them, was put aside. You are to feed my sheep, Peter. You are to nurture them, keep them safe, encourage them, help them to grow, Peter. You have a new function and direction. This is what you are to do for me, Peter. And so we've read this morning from Peter's heart and Peter's mind in the words of his first letter, chapter 1. And he's encouraging people. He's encouraging people who, in verse 6, greatly rejoice. Greatly rejoice in their coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Peter had in his conversion. They come to the great knowledge of the hope which is before them. But he says there, though now for a season, for a little time, not very long, just for a period of time, and if needs be, so there's some sort of purpose being highlighted here, you are in heaviness. What a contradiction from Peter. What a contradiction. You're rejoicing on the one hand and on the other you're in heaviness. Sounds like somebody can't make up their own mind, is it? doesn't it? You are burdened, you are weighed down, you're finding things hard going despite the great inner pleasure that you have and the joy. And it's because you are suffering from manifold temptations. I've heard this verse quite rightly used to refer to the sorts of things that are external to us that attract us away from the service of God and to be aware of those things and to not let them crowd God out of our lives and lose our salvation. Quite right. But I wonder whether that's what Peter is actually thinking of there. You are in heaviness through manifold temptations. What sort of temptations were Peter's temptations that he could draw on? The don't worry, I'll fix it, Peter, Jesus. Count on me, I will do it. I've got it all out. Do it my way, everything will be sorted. We'll put you on, on the kingdom throne. Not a worry, leave it to me. I'll rally, I'll tell people who you are. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Not a problem. No, Peter. Feed my sheep. Those inner temptations, those inner ideas and thoughts and appreciations that come from within the man were holding Peter back. And Christ said himself, didn't he? That it's not the external things that corrupt the man, it's the things that come from within that corrupt the man and defile them. Those inner things that come out of us as a person that get in the road of us 
manifold temptations, layer upon layer upon layer of, com of complexity, which we find in ourselves hard to unravel and to sort out in our own minds sometimes, despite the things that we know. But it did say that if needs be, so there's a sense of purpose here, and the purpose is that the trial of your faith being much more precious of gold that perisheth, the trial of your faith, that's what it's about, this faith stuff. That's what it's about. The proof, the proving of your faith, the finding the metal of your faith, the strength of it, the putting of it into practice and maturing of it. That is much more precious. No, it's not just more precious, it is much more precious, the AV adds. It is greatly more precious than gold that is refined, though no, how, no matter how, how pure it is, it how how much its luster is, much more precious than that, that it might be found to praise and honour and glory. You know, people strive for gold, thinking it's going to make them great. Yes, they might live in lavish houses and be able to buy what they want and influence nations. It says nothing about the person, absolutely nothing. They might be able to wield power by it, but it says nothing of the character of the man or the woman. But this praise, sorry, this faith stuff might be found, found once it's been tested, might be found to praise and glory and honour at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Well, hang on a minute, Je uh, Peter. Jesus has already been, hasn't he? That's past tense. What do you mean? Well, Peter was there, wasn't he, when the angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? The same man, Jesus, who you've seen go into heaven, shall return in like manner as you have seen him go. Yes, Jesus will return to this earth. And it is then, then, that the faith that we have and show in our lives will bring its rewards. You know, Peter is really quite in awe of us and those he was writing to, particularly at that time. But to anybody who believes in Jesus following his, his time, because he says, whom ye have not seen. That's us. We have not seen Jesus. Peter did three years in his company. Walked who knows how many dusty miles with him, ate with him communed with him, talked with him, listened to him, saw his miracles. We have not seen him, yet we love him. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Our belief, brethren and sisters, is actually translated in us to joy, unspeakable, because it gives us assurance and comfort. Comfort in God and assurance of the things that are coming upon this earth and the wonderful nature of it. Joy, unspeakable and full of glory. That's what knowing Jesus does to us. That's what knowing Jesus does in us daily. Verse 9, the receiving, the end of your faith. The end of your faith. It's a transitory thing. Faith, he says. It's not going to last. You're not going to need it forever. It has an end point. After which it's going to be superfluous. And if Hebrew, the writer to the Hebrews is correct and that Faith is the substance, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen, then he's quite correct. Because when Jesus returns, faith is out the window. Because everything we've hoped for and the evidence that's been presented to us will be before our eyes. 100% reality. Absolute existence. No doubting whatsoever. Jesus will be there before our very eyes and will be living in his kingdom, much hoped for 
throughout the millennia. So receiving at the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come. Yes they did. The prophets are full of it. Full of it from beginning to end. And they prophesied that it should come unto you. Not in their time. In our time. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful experience that they had. But wouldn't they have loved to have been now. By seeing Jesus having already been. And foreseeing the sacrifice that would happen. To know that it all came about. That we now live in this afterglow as it were after those events. In the sure hope of Jesus' return. So they prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. I love the book of Daniel. In that last chapter of his, chapter 12, after receiving all those wonderful prophecies that lead us so well into the book of Revelation, he says to the angel, look, when are these going, things going to happen? It's a logical question. He gets all this information. When's it going to happen? And the angel says to him, Daniel, shut up the book. It's not for you to know. It's for the latter times. And he gives a very pithy description of the latter times. Many shall run to and fro in the earth. And knowledge shall be increased. In May this year, there was recorded 19,000 airliner flights in one day, 24 hour period. 19,000. That doesn't count the light aircraft that were airborne, the military aircraft that were flying around doing whatever they were doing, the people on the trains, the cars, the bicycles, the motorbikes, the ships. Men will run to and fro in the earth. And knowledge will be increased. Hasn't it increased? We've had to invent computers to deal with it all because our own brains can't cope with it. If we're not living in the, living in the days mean, meant by that angelic description to Daniel, then who knows how busy we're going to get and how knowledgeable we're going to get before Christ returns. Surely it can't be far away. But the angel does say to him, don't worry, Daniel. This is not for you to know. But you will rest in your lot when Christ returns. That was the inference. You will rest in your lot. So they looked for the things that would follow. So Peter is quite correct when he says that. They looked for that day and the promises that would come in faith. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister, in verse 12, the things which are now reported unto you, by them that have preached the gospel unto, the, unto you, with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The angels don't know everything. They too are God's helpers, God's agents of work. His ministering spirits, as it were. So they too look for into these things. Little wonder they rejoice when one is baptised because they know that there is still time. That much they know. Only God knows how long. Verse 13. So because we know all these things, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Get your mind sorted out. Clear out what's not needed to be there. Strengthen your mind. Interesting word, gird. We put it into the word girders these days, don't we? When we want to strengthen a building, we put girders in them. Make it stronger, make it more rigid, make it more reliable. Make it purposeful so that it doesn't fall over, doesn't fail. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. 
Let's not suffer from the effects of being inebriated by the things that are going on around us, by being inebriated by the things that clutter up our lives so that we can't think clearly. Think clearly with conviction concerning the things of God and putting those teachings of our Lord Jesus into practice in our lives daily. Clarity of mind. It's an important thing and very adaptable for all circumstances if we have the eyes of Christ, the mind of God, and the heart of our Lord Jesus. So be clarify the sorry, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. A great gift of undeserved favour toward us. And how do we do that? Verse 14, as obedient children. Following our Lord's teaching, following our Lord's commands, following the life shown to us by Jesus according to the character and will of our Heavenly Father. As obedient children, not fashioning ourselves according to our former lusts in your ignorance. Peter was in ignorance, wasn't he? Peter thought he had it all sorted out. He didn't. He was in ignorance and had to learn a lot about not only the plan of what was going to happen in terms of the kingdom, but to examine himself inwardly. To examine those things that were temptations to react in certain ways which were not appropriate. And so we leave our former thinking behind. And we, verse 15, behave as the way that God wants us to behave, where Peter writes that we should behave as he which has called us is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of our conversation, in all manner of our lives. Then he harks back to Leviticus chapter 11 and says, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Be separate, there's no harm in that. God's not like the world and we want to be with God. Be separate away from these things in our hearts and minds. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's works, pass the time of your sojourning in fear. Are we to be afraid of this? I think we're more likely to be, he means that we mean to be afraid of not attaining unto that great reward but also the fear there is not so much the afraid kind of fear it's the fear of respect it's the fear of reverence for the things of God our Father you cannot come before the Father with any sense of expectation that we would be heard if we do not revere him so pass the time of our life in reverence for God. For as much as ye know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from the tradition of your fathers. No, he had to leave all of those things behind at his conversion when he understood that he was to be redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus but with the precious blood of Christ as being redeemed, verse 19, precious blood of all the bulls and goats and lambs and pigeons and things that had been doves, sorry, had been sacrificed over the years. They could not take away sin. But the precious blood of Christ can and does if we submit to it. There's only one, only one person's blood. Nobody else's. That's how precious it is, not only in terms of its availability and rarity, but because of the greatness of the things that it brings about in our lives. 
precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot who was ordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you in these last times harking back to Daniel don't worry about it Daniel these things are held for the last days in the last times he was manifest for you and I who by him do believe in God that's the great purpose isn't it of Jesus it's to bring us back to God Jesus has helped build that bridge to God and he's gone before us over it and we're to follow in that path on the building of Jesus bridge so that we come to God and believe him and he shows that he has done that continuing in verse 21 because that he raised him Jesus from the dead and gave him glory we have the testimony of Stephen, don't we? That he saw Jesus at the right hand of God. Raised him to glory. That your faith and hope might be in God, the Father. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, we have in our baptism. Seeing that we have done that and said, we want to be with you, Jesus. We want to be with God, the Father, your Father. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren there's a follow-on effect of that isn't there being baptized into Jesus means that we also love others as he loved us the effect of that baptism means that we love our brethren fait accompli no question don't ask any more about that don't question it that's what's supposed to happen that's what should come from within us. He says, unfeigned love of the brethren, that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Brother Alfred Norris, in his book, Peter, Fisherman of Men, a Fisher of Men, suggests that the companion of Cleopas on the morning rock may well have, who was unnamed in the passage in Luke, may well have been Peter. May well have been Peter. And it's an interesting little discussion he goes into making that suggestion. But to reflect on that story, they said one to another, Cleopas and his companion, Peter or no, didn't our hearts burn within us when he opened up the word to them and telling them all the things that should happen to Jesus? before he received glory. That burning phrase, I think, Rivers reflected in this, that we should love one another with a pure heart, fervently, with that deep yearning from within, almost a fire, with compassion and love and friendship and fraternity for our brothers and sisters. Verse 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Yes, God lives and abides forever. He's from everlasting to everlasting. So of course his word is from everlasting to ever, everlasting and abides forever. But there's someone else he's talking about there, isn't there? It's Jesus. The word of God made flesh, having been risen from the dead, now abides forever in that person of Jesus of Nazareth. So he's talking about him as well. The word of God which liveth and abideth forever in its truth and its example and it's in the embodiment in Jesus. Verse 24, for all flesh is as grass and all glory is of the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower faileth away, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. 
unto you. Who? Verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to strangers scattered. We're strangers. We don't belong here. We belong in another place. We belong in that time when Jesus returns, don't we? That's the land, the home, the place we belong. We have to act like we belong there now. We have to be like we belong there now. Strangers with no place to go at the moment. And we're scattered all around the world now and in ages past and for whatever time remains. One here, one there, a clutch of people here, a body of people in this hall today, wherever we are, we're scattered without a home. In this instance, he's writing to those at Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Wherever we are, we are in verse 2, elect. God knows us, every one of us. And he wants you and you and you. And in his mercy, me as well. He wants us, he knows us. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Taken away, held separately, sanctified, specially for the purpose of God, through the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ that we talked about earlier. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Undeserved favour to you, brother and sister, and peace be at harmony with God. May that harmony of God through undeserved favour be multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied to counter those manifold transgressions. God balances it all out for us. Peter had to learn that. He was found wanting. He had nothing more that he could do. He was crushed. He wept bitterly until he realised that Jesus was fixing it all up. And so, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy is multiplied, multiplied mercy, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Yes, it's alive in Jesus sitting at the right hand of our Father by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, unto an inheritance which is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved. It's reserved for us when we make a reservation at a restaurant and we turn up on time. We expect that table to be there for us. It's held, it's reserved for us. Nobody else can take it away unless we cancel it, unless we cancel the reservation. In like manner, that hope which is before us is reserved by God in heaven where no man can corrupt it, no man can take it away from us, no man can tamper with it, alter the books. No. It's a surety. It's incorruptible. And it's undefiled and it's reserved in heaven for you to be received at the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ when he returns to this earth. It's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so we are back where we started. We are in you greatly rejoice. We can joy immeasurably at all of these things. We come before this table this morning, before the bread and wine, the bread symbolising the body of Christ, the bread of life, not the bread that fades away that the great masses were after. They were after the free meal. This bread of truth, concerning God and who and what we are about, as shown to us in Jesus, leads to eternity. 
and we share the wine, symbolising the sprinkled blood of Jesus, which takes away our sins and presents us snowy white before Lord God Almighty's eyes, according to his grace and mercy.